Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Damrell. I am the um, one of the planning members of the summit series and also on the leadership development committee. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker, Stephanie Smith. Stephanie is an executive coach and organizational coach that um, has spent 20 years, the last 20 years, really helping individuals and organizations um, reach their fullest leadership potential. Uh, for me, Stephanie's been my professional slash personal coach for at least 15 of those 20 years. And I can't tell you how many times I've left a conversation with her where I felt a sense of calmness or clarity or confidence to make adjustments in um, my path and my direction and continue to move forward. Um, I'm excited and I'm gonna be listening with rapt attention as she shares her insights with taking action on your own behalf. So with that, I'd like to um, bring on Stephanie Smith. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining us. Hi, thanks, Amy. Um, and I can't believe it's been 15 years. <laughs> I think I was younger then. So uh, good morning, everyone. I wanna talk with you today about taking action on your own behalf. And I'm gonna be sharing five rules with you to support you in bringing your needs and your goals to fruition. But before we get to the five rules though, I must share with you the pre-rule. So if I can get the first slide. The pre-rule is this, time is limited. And because time is limited, it's important to put aside any notion that you are supposed to wait your turn or wait to be seen, or not take action on your own behalf because it would make others feel bad. You are re not responsible for how others feel, not strangers, not the people you work with or live with or even love. Now, am I suggesting that in order to take action on your own behalf that you must abandon your relationships? Of course not. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Taking action on your own behalf requires that you consider the relationships, ah, the relationships in your life that are good for you, but that you don't limit yourself based on their fears. You see, sometimes the people we love get frightened when we do things that are new or different. That's why it's important to share your thinking of course, as is age base appropriate, you don't want to tell your three-year-old what's going on, with those you love in a way that respects both you and them. Now, you might be asking, take your action to do what? Well, I would argue that it's time to curate your life. A well-curated life has to have a few focal points. In addition, some smaller things that are balanced and aligned with the focal points. And there, have to, there has to be enough space and color to spark imagination. Now, research shows that the one thing all of us want is a meaningful life and a successful life. Therefore, it's important to know how to take action on your own behalf to create that life. Your, create, your curated life should be meaningful and successful to you. You get to be you. And to be your best you, it's gonna take a little thought and planning. Time is limited. Therefore, we have little to waste. Next slide, please. So we have five rules for taking action on your own behalf. Those rules are articulate what matters to you, pause, generate opportunities, deal with obstacles, and influence others and be influenced by others. Let's go into each of these in greater detail. Next slide, please. Rule number one, articulate what matters to you. Before you can know what actions to take, you have to determine your goal. What is your one thing that you will call the focal point of your life? It might be your job, your family, your kids, vacations, your health, anything of your choosing. Now that's not to say that you won't have many goals, but it's helpful to have one or two main goals at a time. Otherwise, you risk overwhelming your ability to accomplish any of them. Naming what matters to you is the first step in determining what actions you take. So in order to understand what matters to you, it's helpful to determine what skills do you wanna offer the world? What fuels your soul? What brings you joy? What is your priority? What creates a feeling of success for you? Now, too often when we are busy with life, work, and everything in between, we get pulled into managing the thousand things that are coming our way. Eventually, we get worn down 
and treat everything as if it's of equal importance. Now, the trick is to learn which of those things are important and which are fodder. Remember, time is limited, so you have to be intentional about where you put your energy. Naming what matters to you and determining which one or two of these is most important to you will give you a sense of direction and purpose. When you have identified your one goal, the thing around which everything else is balanced and aligned, you can start then to determine what action is required to support and enhance the thing that matters to you. Next slide, please. The second rule is to learn to pause. Now, no, this is not a trick or a typo. In order to take action, you must know how to pause in order to ensure that you're acting on behalf of the things that are most important to you. Now, when I talk about pausing, I mean that you are able to interrupt your reactions and formulate a response. Now, a reaction can be verbal or nonverbal. Verbal reactions are pretty self-explanatory. They tend to be emotional outbursts of some sort. Nonverbal reactions include sighing, pounding of the fist, turning your back, sitting back, glazing over, turning your camera off, things like that. It's important to remember that people see nonverbal reactions faster than they hear audible ones. So you wanna be sure that you are communicating the things that you intend to communicate. Now, for those of you who sometimes speak before you think, you can probably imagine the power of pausing. I've worked with many people who call themselves blurters. They usually come to see me because they've gotten themselves into hot water by blurting the first thing that comes to their mind. Even if that blurt was true, they had not considered the impact of that uh, statement. Blurters have trouble aligning their intention with their impact. That's why pausing is so effective. It slows the blurt. Now, for all of you introverts out there who might be thinking, hey, this slide doesn't apply to me. Well, unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. You see, as an introvert, your reaction might be to say nothing or to sit back and let someone else speak up you could change the subject or hurry to the next agenda item. As an introvert, not sharing your thoughts or ideas is not in your best interest if you're trying to take action on your own behalf. Staying quiet doesn't protect you. It merely prevents you from engaging in areas of your life that you probably shouldn't leave to others. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, when you pause, you have the opportunity to slow your roll and determine the best response for you at that time. Your response is always situational and dependent on the outcome you seek. So using the list of what matters to you, you can start to shape the outcome you wanna see by choosing how you show up, what you do and what you don't do. A great way to determine the best response is to pause and ask yourself, is what I'm about to say or do in alignment with my one goal? Then you can formulate a response that is aligned with that goal. Using that information, you will be able to start to bring opportunities to your life that will help you achieve your goals. Next slide, please. The third rule is generate opportunities. When you generate opportunities, you are thinking strategically about what you need to do to advance your one goal. Now you can also look for opportunities, but looking alone is just too passive. When you generate opportunities, you are utilizing everything you know to create a path toward getting what you want and the timeline that works for you. Now, one of the best ways to generate opportunities is to network. That's a way of using the people you know to move forward on your path. And now if networking is defined as schmoozing, I would bet that at least half of you rolled your eyes at seeing this on the list. But if I tell you that networking is about building relationships that are informative and teach you something, 
then the thought of networking probably just got a whole lot easier for you. I know it does for me. Engaging with people one-on-one -on -one gives you the opportunity to learn about their journey and to share yours. And in that exchange of, of uh, information is where opportunities lie. Another way to generate opportunities is to listen thoughtfully in meetings to your boss, to your employees, to your teammates, even to your kids. Most people are telling you what they need and what they want. The trick is to hear what they are saying below the static, the complaints, and the fears. You see, everyone wants to be seen and heard. Yet for some reason, plain old simple language is rarely used when people are stuck. Listen for what people need and determine if there's an opportunity for you that fits your goals. Now, the next way to generate opportun opportunities is to offer your point of view. People need to know what you're thinking if you're going to be valued for your thoughts. When you share your point of view, you wanna be sure to own it by saying things like, the way I see it, or in my opinion. Now don't apologize or diminish your perspective with, statement like, with statements like, I don't know if this makes sense, or this probably doesn't matter, but, or, and this is my pet peeve, um, I feel like. I wanna talk a little bit more about I feel like. And I want to implore each of you to please take I feel like out of your vocabulary. Like is not a feeling. You can feel mad, glad, sad, and scared, but you can't feel like. When women say, I feel like, I guarantee that most listeners in the business world stop listening. They don't want to talk about your feelings, which I know seems harsh, but it's true. <laughs> the correct substitute for I feel like is I think. The good news is that I think is a far more assertive and decisive statement. For example, which is more, which is more powerful? I feel like he's a jerk or I think he's a jerk. In the first statement, the problem is me. In the second statement, the problem is him. So please, every time you start to say, I feel like, stop yourself and change the word to I think or I believe. It's subtle. And yet it's an important part of taking action on your own behalf because you have to start taking your words seriously. Now, another way to generate opportunities is to know your value. It's important that you are able to articulate what solutions you will bring to bear on the issue at hand. Share why you are the person that can help take the project team or initiative forward. This is not bragging, this is information. The trick here is to speak about the needs of the organization and not your personal need. So in other words, don't go to your boss and say, my goal is to own a yacht, therefore I need a raise or anything that resembles anything like that. Because honestly, again, they don't care. What they care about and what you will therefore need to talk about is what the organization needs and how you can or will fulfill that need better than anyone else, or at least as well as anyone else. The one thing I've learned in my 20 plus years of doing this work is that men often enter an organization with the attitude of, what can this group for, do for me? And women enter with the attitude of, what can I do for this group? And I think the healthiest response is somewhere in the middle. Just as in relationships, your work setting should be beneficial to both parties. You can't just give all the time and get nothing in return that creates resentment. But women often don't articulate what they want because they are focused on giving. They give and give and give and hope someone will someday notice. Your honoring and being able to speak to the value that you are or could be bringing to the organization is critical. And it's equally important to determine what you need from the organization to stay engaged be that title, money, special projects, any number of things. You see, it's a both and situation and not an either or. Finally, the last way to generate opportunities 
is to stay curious and avoid certainty, especially when it comes to what's possible. When you stay curious, you open yourself to learning new ideas and being part of an innovative conversation. It's helpful to have some statements in your pocket like, what if, have we ever? What could be gained by? What would we risk if? You see, when you generate opportunities, you open the door to try new things to see what works and what doesn't. Next slide, please. So fall down seven times, stand up eight is a Japanese proverb that reminds us that failure only happens if we stop getting up. And why is that important? Next slide, please. It's important because you are going to have to deal with obstacles, which is rule number four. In order to best deal with obstacles, it helps if you think like a scientist. Hypothesize, test your hypothesis, learn from results, create a new hypothesis, test your new hypothesis, learn from those results. Now, I was, when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, toddlerhood is probably the age when we're all closest to being a true scientist than at any other time in our life. Let me explain. Toddlers hypothesize that they can walk. Now true, it's hardwired in us, but still it's just a theory until they have done it. So they try. It doesn't occur to them that if they don't walk the first time, they should just give up. Nope, they get up, they fall. They adjust, they get up, they fall, they adjust. In other words, they learn from each failure to walk until they put all the pieces together. Yes, there will be obstacles. And if you think like a scientist, you will not throw your hands up in despair, but instead you will look for what went wrong and then modify your approach. If you normalize the reality of obstacles, you are more likely to continue taking action on your own behalf until you're able to find the way that does work. When obstacles are a surprise or an unexpected outcome, you focus on the failure and not on the opportunity to learn. So the next thing to do when dealing with obstacles is to develop stamina. Taking action on your own behalf is not a one and done. Stamina allows you to fail and not be devastated by the failure. Yeah, it's gonna sting sometimes, but as you build your stamina, the sting will lessen. Stamina is critical to you taking action on your own behalf. So don't allow one, two, or even 10 oops stopping you from regrouping on behalf of your goal. Now, for all of you who have kids and watch them learn to walk, you will never, you would never discourage them after a couple of failed attempts. You wouldn't say, oh, well, too bad, not gonna happen. I urge you to remember how you might encourage a toddler who is learning to walk when you start taking action on your own behalf. Now, some of the things that happen in life are based on things that are outside our control, but too many of us use that information to give up all control. Don't be lured into thinking you're not lucky or that you can't aid, take action until something outside your control happens. Too many of us interpret our failures as signs of personal weakness or as a character flaw and nothing could be further from the truth. Just as falling down is critically linked to walking, your failures are critical to your success. In order to deal with obstacles, you will need to challenge your own assumptions and your truths. More often than not, when we try something outside our comfort zone, we get in our own way. We are the reason we don't take action on our own behalf. We get an old truth lodged in our craw and we never question it. We throw our hands up and embrace defeat. Remember, it's important to learn from your failures, past failures, present failures, and future ones. Next slide, please. The final rule is to influence others and to be influenced by others. Our definition of leadership is the willingness to influence others and the willingness to be influenced by others, regardless of position or title. Now, the ability to influence others will support you in taking action on your own behalf. And so that means creating a shared vision and moving toward that vision together. This is an important part of taking action because you have to be able to bring others along with your vision, whether that's someone in your household or someone you work with or the organization you work for. 
influencing others isn't about steamrolling them. It's about offering them information so that they understand and excited and are excited about the future that you are presenting. And when influencing others, please avoid the phrase, I feel like, or I feel that. Both will hinder your ability to bring others along because it creates seeds of doubt. The next piece is the ability to be influenced by others. As women, we tend to do this better, but oftentimes it can be to our detriment. We need to be influenceable, absolutely, but we also need to be able to hold on to our one goal and set boundaries to ensure our success. Women can be over accommodating about things that they later regret. By being a leader of your life, you get to determine what you do and how you get there. By influencing others and being able to influence, you become a better collaborator. And collaboration is key to achieving your goal because we are a relational species. We survive by being in relationship with others. And so the ability to collaborate is, is the thing that will enable things to happen for us. A quick aside, historically, virtually all research was based on men. It was assumed that if it was true for men, it was true for women. Well, recently, probably the last 20 years, um, someone asked what it was that women did in times of crises. Now, we all know men launch into fight or flight mode, but what do women do? Well, it turns out that women congregate. They gather and determine how to best care for those who are dependent on others for survival, the old, the young, the ill. They coordinate and they collaborate. And I think that's really an important part of our DNA to remember. Now, finally, it's important to continue to build your emotional intelligence. Understanding yourself and others is critical to achieving your one goal. None of us lives in a vacuum. So we must figure out how to have our goal in mind while also relating to the world in which we are achieving that goal. Next slide, please. So I wanna end with a Chinese proverb that I think is very relevant to taking action on your own behalf. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So today, I would like to encourage each of you to start to curate your life. Use the five rules to take action on your own behalf. And as always, always offer your very best. Thanks so much. So I think we're gonna open it to questions. Hi, uh, yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, feel free to type in any questions into the chat and or join us in our breakout session at uh, 1130 if you have any questions for Stephanie um, at the end of the session. In the, in the meantime, I've got a couple of real life scenarios that I'll throw at Stephanie here for okay. her input. Um, so let's say you are in an organization that you really enjoy and you feel like your value and your talents are seen and appreciated generally at large, but mm -hmm. um, you have a direct supervisor who maybe doesn't see that value or doesn't articulate it. And that's the person that you're needing to work with either for you know salary increase or permissions or promotions or personal development mm -hmm. opportunities. What advice would you have um, in that scenario? Well, I think that in that case, what's probably important is to find someone outside the little um, dyad system that you're talking about and someone who understands what you're doing and can help influence the larger system to see, um, to influence your boss to say what's going on or that boss. I think that um, when people feel stymied by an individual, they forget that you can influence around that individual to try to help them see what you're contributing. And I think, but it's a tricky one because I think um, that we often get stuck thinking this obstacle is the end of my, I can't go past that. So I think you may have to build relationships outside that uh, single relationship so that other people get a chance to talk about and understand the value that you're bringing to the organization. It's a tough one, there's no question. So here's another situation I know some who are facing right now is um, during the last year, some people have taken reduced work schedules um, you know, 10 or 20% less hours, but feel that they're contributing on or above, you know, the same contributions as people full time, but feel now that they might be missing out on opportunities for advancement within their career because of that. So any suggestions mm -hmm. with how to tackle that um, scenario? 
Yeah, I think that uh, it this this really goes to the value that someone is bringing and being able to um, highlight that value appropriately. And I, I also think there's going to be a bit of a reckoning. Women clearly took the biggest hit when it came to the, um, the pandemic and having to take time to help kids with school and or to cut hours. It, it's been written about a lot, including there was a huge article in the New York Times this weekend about um, women are struggling, right? And, and I think it's, it is going to be have to be that opportunity to share your value. And I think to push back on this notion that, well, if you're not full time, you're not contributing well. So I think that's problematic. And uh, I, again, I would argue with what's your goal and how do you work with other people in the organization to influence and change some of that um, predetermined notion that somehow you're not contributing enough if you're not 41.5 hours or something. So. Thanks. So we've had um, one question is, uh, any tips for feeling confident when you don't feel experienced enough in a certain technical area? So are you given stretch assignments and or ever, you know, overcoming the feeling of imposter syndrome? Mm. So um, confidence, confidence is a tricky thing. It, it, it's, um, it's important to, to give yourself verbal reinforcements. And I know that sounds so silly, but I think saying things like, I can do this, it really does change the brain. It also saying things like, this is going to be fun, or what will I learn, changes the brain from ah, I'll get in trouble, right? 80% of the time, our brain is looking for what's wrong or what we should be afraid of. And so countering that with the more positive, hey, this is fun, I'll learn something. And if you can give yourself a little space not to be perfect, I think women are really hard on, we are, we are hard on ourselves about perfection. Like if somehow, if you don't do it right, forget it, there's no point. And that's really why when I drive down this, to drive home this notion about learning from failures, right? And so it's like, oh, what am I going to learn today? How can I do this? I got this. I can make this happen. And I think asking for stretch goals actually is a good way for an organization to see your value and your potential. And I think you have to note it. It's like, hey, this is kind of a stretch for me. I'll see what I can do. I, I think owning that gives you more latitude to get comfortable with whatever happens and try to manage that. Great, thank you so much. As we um, close down now, there's been a question of if these five rules are rules that you developed, are they somewhere people can access or tap into? And if you could just kind of summarize them as we close out. Um, they're actually rules that we've developed, my company, uh, because we, we do a lot of work uh, with women in the years that we've been doing this. Um, and these are the these are the things that tend to always come up for people um, in the years we've been doing this work. So articulating what matters to you, pausing, generating opportunities, dealing with obstacles, and influencing others and being influenced by others. So if you can if you can nail those five, and you don't have to do them in order, obviously. I mean, some things you may be really good at, but I think those are the five things you want to hold on to when you're taking action on your own behalf. Um, because you matter, your life matters, and getting the life that you want is uh, really important for you, for your family, and, and it's important for your self-esteem and, and your livelihood. Great. Thank you so much. I see some other questions rolling in, but I know we're, we're getting running out of time here. So I would just encourage um, everyone who's interested to, again, join the breakout session at the end of our, our formal words and close out. And um, I just want to thank you, Stephanie, for your time today and providing okay. us your insights and um, suggestions with how to move forward and be our own, our own best advocates. So My thank pleasure. you so very much. All right. Uh -huh. Take good care.